This is Dr. Joe Sprinkle, and I will be giving a short lecture <clears throat> on Psalm 73, which is a wisdom psalm that speaks about envy of the wicked. A brief introduction. Author of this psalm, according to the superscript, is a man by the name of Asaph. Asaph was a Levite, a descendant of Levi's son Gershom, as mentioned in 1 Chronicles 6, 39 through 43, who served as a musician at the time of David. And David appointed Asaph to minister before the ark, according to 1 Chronicles 15 and 1 Chronicles 16. Asaph was also known as a seer, 2 Chronicles 30 and verse 29. His descendants continued to be singers in the temple at the time of Jehoshaphat, 1 Chronicles 25, 1. And centuries later, after the exile, the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, they continued to minister. Asaph appears to have written Psalm 73 as a personal testimony in order to teach others. The genre of this psalm is what you might call reflexive wisdom. Wisdom writings generally emphasize that if you obey God, you'll be blessed and prosper, but if you disobey God, you will not do well. This particular psalm is a subcategory of wisdom known as reflexive wisdom. Reflexive wisdom deals uh, with uh, that general wisdom theme on a more profound level than its presentation, say, in the book of Proverbs. Psalm 73 deals with occasions where experience seems to contradict wisdom theory. Especially, Asaph has run into uh, patently wicked people who are clearly prospering. Well, how is it that uh, the wicked can prosper and he not be prospering if God is good to those who trust in him. And so the question is how to mesh this ordinary wisdom and general wisdom teaching uh, that those who obey God do better than those who do not obey him. The books of Job and Ecclesiastes are also examples of reflexive wisdom. Psalm 73 deals with why the wicked prosper. The book of Job deals with another aspect of this same question, why do the righteous suffer? Ecclesiastes deals with problems of skepticism and faith on a philosophical level. Basic wisdom, you might say, would be for uh, children and teens, while reflexive wisdom is more advanced for mature adults, you might say. And so let's get into the uh, content. Uh, the basic theme of wisdom is found in verse one, which says the following, uh, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But then this basic theme of wisdom is immediately challenged. What about the wicked who prosper? And that's what verses 2 through 16 will talk about. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps were all, had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant <clears throat> as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills, and therefore pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous heart comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know, knows no limit. They scoff. They speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth, and therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They increase in wealth. 
Surely I have kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. And so looking at these wicked people, he raises the question, does righteousness really pay off? He's dismayed that wicked people uh, seem to be, be prospering while Asaph himself, a, a, a righteous person is not prospering so much. And this raises the question, does, does righteousness really pay off? Does God really do good to the pure in heart, which is the thesis of verse 1? Or have believers sacrificed pleasures and freedoms for nothing? For, in fact, negative results. And so this is reflected in Asaph's uh, meditation of doubt. He says this, uh, he says, if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. He's clearly showing the distress of intellectual turmoil and disorientation from this visible challenge to orthodox wisdom that he sees in his life. And apparently he's toyed with the idea of even abandoning his, uh, his belief, uh, rejecting his faith altogether. However, he was reluctant to share his thoughts because that would serve to undermine the faith of others that he labels God's children. If I would speak you know, my mind clearly, I would have betrayed your children. And uh, he didn't want to do that because he, despite having the intellectual turmoil, he still believes, <clears throat> and yet uh, he does have these oppressive doubts about what his uh, religion has taught him. Again, uh, is what I've been taught true? And if God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked, why are these wicked people prospering? So he goes on to say this, though, that when he went to the temple, he ended up with a stroke of insight. All this was true until I entered the temple, the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Literally, I understood their end. Apparently, while worshiping in the sanctuary, Asaph had this sudden insight. He had been troubled by his thoughts, but now he understood the end of the wicked. And this begins to resolve the intellectual turmoil that he was suffering and had experienced. He realizes that the prosperity of the wicked is only temporary. It's only going to last until their end. Now, of course, what is the end to which uh, uh, Asaph has in mind? Does it refer to this life? Or does it refer to their, the afterlife? Now, Psalm 73 could possibly be taken as a this-worldly statement. Although Israel affirmed that there was an afterlife, and you can read about that in uh, 1 Samuel 28, where Saul uh, uses the witch of Endor to call up Samuel from the grave, most of the Psalms have a this-worldly orientation to them. Afterlife plays no prominent role in the book of Proverbs as a whole. Perhaps Asaph is only thinking of this world, and even in this li life, the wicked are likely to have a bad end. Or perhaps he thinks of the children of the wicked who will suffer for the sins of their parents. And so you could take it as an outcome in this life, but it possibly could refer to the afterlife. Although it's true that not many Psalms refer to the afterlife, Psalm 73 is, in my opinion, very probably an exception to that rule. 
The end of the wicked does not appear to be physical death, since even the righteous die. The difference is that these wicked uh, have had it good while they were alive. Moreover, uh, not all wicked uh, people suffer bad deaths, and uh, nor do all wicked people have children who suffer uh, terribly uh, impossible punishment of their parents' sins. What makes more logical sense in answer to the philosophical issue that Asoph is raising is to take end as a reference to the afterlife, their final destiny, as uh, this translation puts it. In other words, in this life, the wicked may prosper, but in the end, that is, in the afterlife, that will not be so. Asaph's great philosophical insight is that there must be rewards and punishment after death. Again, the Psalms tend to be this worldly, rarely mention the afterlife, but uh, nonetheless here it probably does refer to the afterlife since in experience the wicked may live a full life and not uh, suffer. But in the afterlife, their end will not be good. So Asaph was giving a problem of uh, an answer to a problem of theodicy. Theodicy is trying to explain the ways of God uh, to man, and this psalm uh, does uh, that as, uh, in particular. <clears throat> so. Now he begins his reorientation, starting with verse 18. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed. How completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. The wicked ultimately will be ruined, whether it's in this life or in the next their end will not be good. And this allows him to move from his stupor to faith. Though the prospering of the wicked made the psalmist bitter and stupid for a while, as he says in verse 21 and 2, now the psalmist uh, affirms that God guides him in this life and into the next. Uh, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute before you. Uh, again, when we are uh, uh, in the, a, a depression of uh, a spiritual depression, we, we end up being uh, stupid like a, a dumb animal. But uh, he goes on to say in verse 23 and 24, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will take me into glory. Now, this insight is allowing Asaph now to affirm the orthodox view of wisdom that God guides the righteous into blessing. So, God holds his hand, God guides him with counsel, and afterwards, you will take me into glory. And again, what is this word afterwards referring to? And the sense seems to be this. God guides us in this life, but afterwards, in the afterlife, he takes us into the glory of God's presence. So it's probably a reference to this life and the next, this life guiding me, afterwards taking me into glory. And so though he was tempted to abandon his faith, he is now returned to that orthodox faith. He sees that the righteous will ultimately be rewarded, the wicked uh, will not, when he looks at their final destiny as he looks at their end and what happens afterwards for the believer. And so at the end, he comes back to what he said at the beginning, and he reaffirms orthodox wisdom. 
whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. So Psalm 73 ends uh, with all the earlier doubts having been overcome. The man who was tempted to reject God now affirms his delight in God and his strength as from God. And thus the orthodox view of wisdom ends up being affirmed. Uh, those who are far from you will perish, but it is good to be near God. So what's the value of Psalm 73? And I think there are several lessons we can take from this one. Uh, it teaches us uh, the idea that the victory of the wicked is only temporary. Asaph's insight is very important. Clearly, justice is not always done in this life. But even if the wicked prosper in this life, in the end, they will not. Ultimately, whether in this life or the life to come, God's justice will prevail. The sins of the wicked will catch up with them in either this life or the next, and the righteous who live for God will receive the reward of heavenly glory that God promises to the faithful. Asaph's insight anticipates the New Testament doctrine of heaven and hell. Some people are embarrassed by the biblical doctrine of hell. But Christians should not be. Hell is a doctrine necessary in order to affirm that God is just and fair. Justice does not always happen to wicked people or, uh, in this life. Justice does not happen to good people in this life. If a just and fair God exists, justice in the form of punishing the wicked and rewarding the righteous must then happen in the afterlife. Conversely, if some sort of hell, punishment of the wicked, does not exist, then the good God of the Bible cannot exist either. Those who affirm the existence of the Bible's God must necessarily affirm the concept of rewards and punishments, heaven and hell, if you will, well, uh, in the afterlife, because only this allows us to affirm that a just God exists despite the world's current injustices. That was Asaph's insight, an insight in which the New Testament elaborates. Secondly, it teaches us that we can and should think through intellectual crises of faith. Asaph was dealing with a serious problem, an intellectual problem that many young people brought up in Christian homes go through, namely the questioning of whether or not the religion that they have been taught as children is really true. What do we do when the real world does not seem to correspond with the Christian view? Do we hide our heads in the sand and hope the problem will go away? Or do we sweep the problem under the rug? <clears throat> this psalm and the wisdom tradition generally suggest instead that we should think clearly through intellectual problems of faith. Being troubled with problems of this sort is not the same thing as unbelief. It can, it can be a struggle of the believer to understand more deeply, but naivety is not the same thing as faith, nor is naivety uh, especially commended in Scripture. Cries of faith are not bad. Some of the greatest Christian apologists were prepared by first going through crises of faith. Francis Schaeffer, the founder of Labrie Fellowship, uh, fellowships around the world now, uh, went way back to being an agnostic uh, before producing his very profound, uh, powerful apologetic uh, for the Christian faith, uh, which he uh, wrote books about in the mid-20th century, mid to late 20th century. Uh, 
C.S. Lewis, another great apologist of the 20th century, was an atheist before he became a Christian. And this earlier period of doubt, followed by thoughtful faith, made him one of the greatest apologists of his day. We can and should think through crises of faith, and that may make us more effective in our evangelism and ministry. And then finally, <clears throat> Psalm 73 shows us the process of overcoming doubts. We look at the structure of the psalm. It actually follows a chiastic structure. You have the original affirmation of faith that uh, God is uh, good to, uh, uh, to, to his people and so on and so forth. But then his disorientation in verses uh, uh, 2 through 16. But then that insight that he has in verse 17. And then he reorients himself in verses 18 through 24 as he thinks things through. And then at the end, he is able to reaffirm orthodoxy. Those who go through crises of faith, uh, this is a process that they're uh, not unlikely to go through as well. And so this is a profound little psalm, Psalm 73, a wisdom psalm, a psalm of reflexive wisdom. And it be, can be an encouragement to believers who may experience such crises of faith that others, including a biblical character of Asaph, have gone through such an experience themselves. And that's my presentation of Psalm 73.